All right. Well, maybe I'll do a better job today. That's the <laughs> that's the silver lining. You will do great. Yes. This time we're not starting from scratch. We are starting from experience. Right. right exactly. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you very much. Okay. My, if I can record it, then I stop because we changed video. Um, today I'm speaking to Freebo Rezier, and I'm super excited to speak to you today. And uh, I fortunately had an opportunity to speak to you yesterday, so it's a bit of a do-over, but I'm looking forward very much to the conversation. Um, for people that are unaware, you were one of two female athletes, was the first ever female athletes to go to the Olympics from, from Afghanistan. And you went to the 2004 Olympics, participating in judo as an 18 year old. And your introduction to judo was in the end of the reign of the Taliban after, uh, which would have been around 2002, One. 2001, 2001, um, a Norwegian Olympic athlete, Stieg Travik helped introduce judo to the region and worked with your coach and worked with you and many other athletes in in Afghanistan. Yeah, that is correct. Hi, Josh, and thank you so much for having me in your show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so it's, it's, it's really amazing to see someone get to compete at that level from a country where um, doesn't have the strongest roots in judo. The introduction of judo was relatively new. And one thing that I love about the judo community and the IJF is that there's a huge number of countries that get to participate in judo over 200 nations practice judo throughout the world which is much more than most sports and that the IJF believes it's important to help promote judo in those countries so when you have olympic um, participation they make sure that athletes that wouldn't always have an opportunity to get to that point to get to compete at that level that they get to do that um, believing that it helps bring a stronger uh, future to the sport that you can be a representative of that sport and in a case like yours I don't think they could have done a better job in getting to have a representative of the sport for Afghani men and women yeah um, it was a significant part of the history when I competed at the 2004 Olympic Games um, we were um, four, five athletes uh, we were two girls and uh, um, the other girl was, uh, she was a runner and uh, with three boys, one was also a runner and one was a boxer and uh, the third one was a wrestler. And to show the world that Afghanistan also had athletes and we had female athletes who wanted to compete at the 2004 Olympic Games and compete at that level and to set a precedent um, for the world as well as for gender equality, as well as uh, women's rights and judo sport um, as well. Um, um, a lot of people say that um, congratulations on being the first judoka to compete in the Olympics from Afghanistan or from Afghanistan. That was not um, just in sports of judo, it was also in the, in the whole sports, mm -hmm. all the sports, and it was the first time. And um, yeah, it was a significant, it was life-changing, not only for myself, but for the Afghan women and Afghan um, girls as well, because my participation was um, a sports revolution and it set a precedent for the youth, for the young generation as well back in 2001, um, that women are equal and they can participate at the games and practice judo as anybody else. And uh, our dojo was not supposed to be co-ed, but um, because one of my judo coaches who believes in gender equality and he supported women's rights and girls' rights, uh, girls' rights to sport and education, he opened a dojo for both um, uh, for both genders, and we saw uh, and we were we were realizing the changes that the dojos. The dojo was making in society into opening the doors for women and also uh, encouraging parents to let their girls come to um, to judo sports. Um, and 
because judo is martial arts and martial arts usually has uniform and it's indoor and activity and uh, the uniform is pretty covered. So families were encouraged to bring uh, their girls to um, do, do, do judo. Um, and for me and for all the other athletes, including judo athletes, this was not only sport for us, this was um, a way to bring visibility to women's rights and human rights and democracy. And um, back in 2001, Afghanistan was only, and it was getting ready to, to recover from the Taliban's first reign and to just to stand up on its feet and um, develop and have constitution, have human rights, democracy, and uh, women's rights. Yeah. yeah, and I think as um, for someone being from the Western world, in Canada and the United States and, and Western Europe, the fight for the empowerment of women and women's rights is a real fight. And like that's still happening and it's a really nice progress. To talk about what your coach was doing in the equality of women in this time in Afghanistan is an immensely larger feat. I don't think enough credit can be given. Like when you talk about women and men fighting for the equality of women in Canada, that's a very different conversation than fighting for the equality of women in 2001 in Afghanistan when you had the Taliban. It, women were unable to perform, to practice sports at all. It wasn't, not only were you not given an opportunity, you're given zero opportunity to participate as well as um, the limitations put on the education of women, especially at that time. Yeah, um, definitely, yes. Um, as much as the, um, the Norwegian uh, judo coach and the diplomats in Afghanistan, Steve Dravik, supported uh, women's rights over my judo coach, I had two coaches, uh, to be frankly speaking. One was not very supportive of women's rights, but the second one was, and he's still my coach, and he trained women and girls and even children um, uh, since 2001 to present. And uh, he believed in uh, peace. He he believes that we humans are peaceful in nature and peace through judo for the youth and as well as regionality. He had and he still has very peaceful approach when the fight for that is like a like a battling ground for Afghan women in Afghanistan. Now it's even worse. Um, uh, so it is like you, you go into the uh, battleground on a daily basis and you don't only face, as a woman, you don't only face challenges with your family members, but also um, in the society and even the members of the Afghan Judo Federation and the member of NEC, the Afghan uh, Judo Federation. So in order to measure uh, the gender equality, um, I have always been curious and I've been, because I've been part of the process there, whenever there were judo gi, uh, uh, judo gi donations or they received uh, judo gis. so um, they would always give the majority of the judo gis to the boys and to the men but not to women and the number of women were always fewer than than men and the dojos were always separated and they were segregated by gender only one judo dojo where our judo coach Farhad has he he uh, led and there's so many other differences which are measurable and they were, and you could actually measure the, the, the gender inequality. Like for example, this is not like accurate statistics, but every in every uh, five judo pass, um, um, every five judo pass, the three women in the in the in the five would not get um, the judo gi or the attention or the care, the coaching right. that uh, she deserve. Right, and then. Yeah, right. So there's even once women were allowed to participate in sport, they still weren't getting a fair shake in terms of actually getting coaching time, actually getting the proper attire to perform the sport. And one other thing to that same point that um, that the IJF allowed and changed for was they allowed for a sporting version of the of the uh, I don't want to use the wrong term, but for the hijab, um, the, sorry, hijab. The, Hijab. Hijab, yeah. yes. Um, so women can wear those as a part of their sport, which gives more allowance to women based on their 
based on their religious background that they can perform the sport of judo and still have more of a covering than is normal, which is, which is great. But when you're still not allowing the women and girls in these areas to get judo gis, it makes it very difficult for people that have done judo um, to do judo without a uniform on. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very integral part. There's not a lot of equipment for judo, but the one thing that's important is the judo gi, the, the uniform that we wear. It's a thick cotton that you can grab onto to, to maneuver and, and manipulate your opponent's body. So for women not to get that would limit their ability to practice quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I am proud of um, the IJF that they allowed hijab, and that should be absolutely for the player. Uh, I know there was an argument saying that it could be hazard uh, because there's arm lock and there's choking um, in, 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 in judo, but those women knew what they're doing, and women should have that choice and ability to do that. Yeah, and um, in, in, in Afghanistan, First of all, the majority of the girls were not allowed by their family members to go practice judo. And when they when they resisted or they they just forced themselves to go and they just they went and did it anyways. And once they would have walked on the dojo, they would be harassed. Um, they would be harassed by some coaches, by the male uh, and their male counterparts and the um, just general guys in the in the dojo area. So one one and a half hour of training us the girls would only spend like probably 20 25 minutes to 45 minutes of that time like an actual judo the rest we would be like constantly fighting um that we should we 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 deserve the equal attention for the judo, for the coaches as well. We right. deserve to have a proper judo gi. I remember first time when they received these new judo gis, and I was like, I want one judo gi too. And they they gave all the good ones, the one the new ones and the good ones to the to the boys. And they gave me this judo gi. It had a big it had a big hole on the side and it was torn. And then they were like, Oh, really? You can have this. So you could see the um, the injustice. Um, uh, there and um, yeah, um, definitely. But sports and especially judo played a vital role in um, educating the society, educating mm -hmm. the families. And um, my coach cultivated a culture where the families could come and see um, their daughters um, play sports and interact with the coaches and interact with the boys in the the dojo as well. So that gave them a comfort. And also build the trust between the uh, the coach and the parents and the families. When, when I say parents in, in Canada, when you say parents, it's just mean like parents of the minority. Sorry, minor My children. Mm -hmm. But in Afghanistan, the culture is different. Even if a woman is um, say 20, 21 years old, she's still received as a or seen as the property of her parents, especially father and older brother, not mm -hmm. so much as the mothers. So, so the parents, the, the, these girls who are like in their twenties, they would still come and supervise them and monitor them like mm -hmm. how parents would do here with children. Because right. the majority of time women are not seen as her full person. Right. Um, they're like equal to, yeah, to men, right. she can be responsible, she can be trusted, so they are, treated as a second citizen as in his children um, as well. But um, but we did it. Um, African women did it. When I started judo, we were only three girls in the entire country. We were only three teenager girls. There were other girls as well, but they were very young. They were like nine, eight years old. Mm -hmm. But we were only the three uh, te teenagers. Um, and we wanted to uh, sport, uh, play sport. And, the more the society and our family members pushed us, the more we rebelled against them, the more we wanted to come and we challenged them. And it was very difficult. My dojo was um, about 45 minutes to one hour walk from our home. And my family could not afford a car and I was not right, allowed to ride a bike because girls are not allowed to ride bicycles. Mm. So I would walk and usually I would go for my judo training after uh, my classes. I was at high school at that time. So I would walk and when I, whenever I walked on the streets, I would get harassed verbally and physically until I made it home. And when I came home and then my 
my family members, not everyone from my family members, but mm -hmm. when I say family members, I also mean like extended family members, mm -hmm. they would get mad at me and they would always discourage me from going to support because of my gender. Right. right. So in terms of when you were talking about um, sort of the parents overseeing the daughters, even if they were adults. So I guess in that sense, it's like for a long period of time um, or extended times, or maybe it's happening again now, which we'll get to is the men and older siblings would look after in a sense, but sort of as if property, the younger sister or daughter until they were wed and then it was sort of viewed upon the same way by the husband i'm guessing is that how that that is correct how you explain that as an afghan muslim woman i can confirm that yes mm -hmm. this episode is brought to you by the northwest territories judo association i am proudly the executive director and head coach our focus is on making judo accessible throughout the territory developing students from grassroots to high performance we're incredibly fortunate to have the support of school districts town recreational programs as well as the territorial government please check us out at any one of the links listed below. Right. And then, so this, you do this amazing thing and you continue to push that and inspire young women. Um, and then you go on to moving to Canada and getting your university degree in political science from the University of British Columbia, which is amazing. And, and keep this connection to all these, uh, these women in Afghanistan. And then if you could, I'd like you to go to what's more recently happened, I guess, in the horrendous situation that has rebirthed, I guess. Um, as much as I valued and enjoyed my uh, judo, uh, my sport, I always enjoyed and valued my education as well. Um, education is very important for me. And as soon as I arrived in Canada, I applied to both University Simon Fraser as well as um, University of British Columbia. I was accepted at both places, but I chose to go to UBC and I graduated uh, from UBC majoring in political science. Um, so it was very important uh, for me to have my higher education immediately. And I could see the impact um, and the result of that immediately because um, as soon as I was a little bit professional, I started like writing emails properly. And the, the head of the Afghan judo coach was, um, he felt threatened by me because I could communicate better than him. And so IJF and the IOC members, they started to uh, communicate with me because I, I could simply convey the message um, uh, better and attach an attachment on the email and write an email I have to cc mm. people all those things right. but um he felt threatened and that was the that's the empowerment i received from education and i remember the first time when i went to ubc and i sat down in my class um and i sat i sat on my uh, chair and and the professor came and the professor started um a lecture it was uh, i believe it was uh Canadian politics uh, one on one, 101. And um, the soon he started the lecture and he assigned us uh, assignments and gave us the books, uh, assigned us the books to read, an ocean of knowledge opened to me where I realized that this is, this is limitless. This is where I could thrive. This is where I could empower myself with knowledge. And I enjoyed that so much. And um, um, yeah, and uh, in August last year, um, the most unimaginable thing happened in Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban returned. Um, the Taliban returned um, after 20 years of um, fight with the NATO forces and the US government and, and with, the, with the Afghan government, previous Afghan government. They returned and they captured the uh, capital um, and our previous president, he fled to the neighboring country, Tajikistan. And just the entire country became an uh, orphan and we became leaderless and they, they become our rulers and they became the government now and they're they're leading as soon as they came back um they banned girls education grade above grade six and they also banned women from participating or playing any sports and they immediately shut down our dojo the, the dojo where i used to train and the dojo where our women's national team used to train they did not only ban the uh the dojo they put a giant lock at the door and the taliban fighters and the honey um, fighters um they were patrolling and they still patrol our dojo they are waiting for the girls to come for the training so they can apprehend them so 
there are pictures of them roaming around on our dojo. Sometimes they come inside the uh, dojo and they walk on our mats with their dirty boots and they have the collection called AK-47 guns on their shoulder. And they're just waiting uh, for the girls. They were also looking for my Afghan male coach because he trained women and he allowed mixed gender training. The reason that the Taliban has banned women's sport because according to Taliban's um, Sharia law version, a sport is see seen as a sinful act for women because it brings visibility to women's bodies in public and because it's a physical activity, therefore it's forbidden for women. And the punishment for that is being lashed, lashed and actually lashed 100 times in public or even death penalty. So they released a decree on um, September 19, banning all women from uh, sports. They absolutely um, closed all the sports centers for women um, and even the gyms. Women, women and girls can't even go to the gym these days. Like how would a Vancouver women go for Pilates for yoga or something? No, right. she can't do that um, in Afghanistan. But all the sports are okay for men. So men's mm -hmm. judo team is still training. The boys are still training. And there, there was recently women cycling, um, sorry, women, men cycling a competition. And the Taliban, it's spectators, and they would just went, watched, and enjoyed the competition. But um, there's absolutely no sports um, for, uh, for women. And they did the same thing with the girls' uh, schools. And... Uh, education, they are patrolling around the schools, making sure that girls above grade six, they don't come to the um, classrooms. Right. So, so um, what was there a similar limit? Or was there any education of women prior to 2001? Um, was it similar that it was up to grade six, uh, in the first reign of the Taliban? The first reign of the Taliban, there was no absolute, absolutely no um, schools. They did not even allow uh, any modern education for men. Um, all the schools, the previous uh, Kabul University and other universities, they were completely shut down. And it was the darkest time in Afghanistan. And they really did it for five, five years. Um, but after the American invasion in 2001, and they were, when they were defeated, the Taliban were defeated for the first time, Afghanistan just recovered and they were recovering really fast and they were very progressive and they immediately built um, private schools, private colleges, dojo, sports centers, businesses, you name it, they did. And the past uh, 20 years, um, Afghan women, especially the youth, had very progressive and measurable um, uh, success and progress. Mm -hmm women run for business, they run for parliament, they run for offices. We had all girls robotics team. Um, they competed in Ontario in 2020, in 2019, and they met uh, the prime minister um, and they won gold medal and they made, they were making huge change difference um, in the Afghan society. And there were so many uh, private uh, schools and education for girls was becoming very, very normal. And there were so many modern cafes in big cities, especially like in Kabul, Herat, and Mazar cities. And um, the cafes serve like salmon burgers, bagels, you name it, like all the modern food that you get. And everywhere they serve that too. They even serve the um, chai latte, all those modern cafe mm -hmm. drinks. And right. if you would have, if you'd gone to the one of those cafes, you would feel like you were in a Blinds Coffee or Starbucks in um, in Vancouver. Right. Uh, but in the middle of August, everything was halted by the Taliban. Everything was just shut down. Everything. It's like if you put a pause on time, mm -hmm. and when they returned, it felt like Afghanistan was hit by a giant meteoroid, and it set us back thirty years. Everybody. Taliban wants to wants us to live in like Stone Age style. No mm -hmm. modern technology, no education. Just follow their leadership, whatever um, they say. They have their system of education, but their system of education is only like hardcore extremist Sharia law, which brainwashes um, young people uh, and the adults um, as well, and they want to do. 
right and the and the ironic twist to that is that with all of the with all of the rules and restrictions that are placed upon women and placed upon mothers and people to be mothers is that there's a significant significant consequence to men as well so the men that are putting these rules in play may not understand or don't care that this will have a significant impact on their own lives it has significant impact on their children's lives like if there's anything we know about education is that we learn from one another and when you prevent half of the society from getting any form of education um, and when you have literacy rates that must be incredibly low so that people can't even educate themselves because they have no ability to read and write um, that has a huge impact we know the importance of the role of the mother in a family which more often than not does the majority of the child raising then mothers can't educate their children because they don't get access to this information to educate their own children that's sons and daughters and so that has such a huge impact um i i read at one point that the the most powerful way to change the 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 most powerful way to change and bring a country out of poverty is to educate women that is shown over and over and over again as the most powerful tool that you can use and to overtly pre prevent that is such a damaging impact on the society it's a, it has a damaging impact on the whole world because like yourself you left afghanistan and you live somewhere else um so you know people from afghanistan move other places so the whole world is losing the potential impact of the amazing thing that afghani women can do and afghani sons as well because they're not educated by these women as well yeah, absolutely. They're also doing a lot of damage to themselves. Um, this hurts themselves as well. And they're not realizing that because um, they their children need education. Mm -hmm. And um, they are restricting, um, prohibiting women from going to uh, male doctors. But if there mm -hmm. is no girls' education, if girls right. cannot and women cannot go to middle school, there's not going to be any female doctor for their wives, for their daughters, and for their sisters. So it is hurting uh, them. And um, uh, only if they, if they uh, realized, um, and they want to keep a, a nation in darkness because they know that when a nation is uneducated and ignorant, they can, they can rule. They will believe and follow what, whatever they say or whatever um, uh, they do. But the reason that um, we emphasize a lot on education, because education is the last candle burning in darkness. Taliban regime is a totalitarian regime, and it's the most darkest regime in history and in, human, in humankind and human history. And we cannot let that last a candle um, uh, burn out. And hope is the only thing for, for us. And if we let go of hope, and education is hope for us, we will become a hopeless society. There will be no future. There will be no chance for the next generation um, to thrive, to learn, and for mothers and for, for the kids. Therefore, um, we merged and we started the Women List of Tomorrow um, organization we actually started our work and projects uh, way before the taliban returned and when the government collapsed because our values on women's sports and girls education women's education we remain firm believer of our principles um, and we are committed even more uh, than before to our projects and um, when they when the taliban returned they forced all the women and girls to stay at home uh, but Women Leaders of Tomorrow got creative and we started online programs and online classes for them. We have English language tutoring program as well as mentorship program. It's a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program where um, teachers and mentors are um, all volunteers. They're recruited volunteers and then they, they're recruited from North America and they're connected with their students or learners back um, in Afghanistan. Right now we have 45 uh, mentors, but we are looking for more and we are always welcome new, um, new teachers. And one of our teachers is in uh, New Finland and she taught and tutored a young girl um, from Afghanistan in Afghanistan online. And now that girl got a, she received a 110% uh, scholarship at Seanigan Lake School and she started her classes this, um, this month. Um, this month she's thriving um, 
We also had the sports component goal. It's G-O-A-L, which stands for Girls of Afghanistan Lead. And this was a leadership through sport for Afghan women. So they become instructors, teachers, as well as professional athletes. And we were very successful and we were very lucky um, with um, for partnering with NPU Judos in Japan and Tokai University. And two of our prominent uh, Judo athletes traveled to Tokyo with me back in 2019. And they received professional and advanced um, Judo training from uh, Sensei Kenji at Tokai University. And this was the first time these girls were traveling for the first time internationally. Um, and they went, when they went back, one of them became a prominent uh, judo athlete and competitor. And the second one became a judo coach and sports coach to one of the private uh, schools um, in Afghanistan. And throughout our advocacy and communication, collaboration and dedication, we were able to, uh, we were able to assess um, another girl um, from Afghanistan with full mentorship and advocacy with IJF and International Judo Federation sorry, IOC to compete at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. And she did. She competed as a member of the IOC's refugee team. And that was 100% Women Leaders of Tomorrow's work because we advocated on her behalf and we provided her mentorship with one of our coaches in England and with my Afghan uh, judo coach, um, Farhad Hadrati. And our third and main component and objective of Women Leaders of Tomorrow is that we find and match young qualified Afghan women with the scholarships in North America. We did this before the Taliban, but we are still doing it and we are committed now because scholarship is the only way that these girls are able to have access to education and be able to graduate successfully from colleges, university, even high schools like Shawnigan, um, Shawnigan Lake School to complete because all the, uh, um, the schools are closed um, for them in, in Afghanistan. So the the thing I, I, I want to highlight is, I mean, this is a, as a as an incredible compliment, but there's so many amazing things you're doing and it's so much information that I'm, I'd like to, if it's okay, somewhat recap some of the things you highlighted because, um, to do what you've done is such an incredible, um, such an incredible thing. Um, as a father of two children, uh, as a person that's coached judo for 12 years, I, I like to tell myself, if you can make an impact on one person, how powerful that can be. And when you see it in that individual, I coached a child that had significant learning disability in high school, he became an international athlete and the, and the, and working with him for that period of time and the bond that you have is such a powerful thing. So you got a woman, you were integral in getting a woman a full scholarship that wasn't only 100%. It was more than that. So costs above that 100% incidental costs of, of living and doing that, um, as well as her being able to leave a, a, a horrific situation and, and become educated in Canada, where women weren't allowed to be educated at all. And then it had been a ceiling and we put it at grade six. So she's in university in British Columbia in large part from what you've done. So already incredible. Then you were able to bring people to Tokai University. So people that don't fully know, there's two meccas, I would say, of judo in the world. One is the Kodokan. It's the birthplace of judo. It started in a small temple. It's now this incredible facility that I've yet to see. One day I will uh, in Tokyo, Japan. The second is Tokai University's dojo, which is probably produced more Olympic gold medals than any other dojo in the history of judo anywhere on earth. So you work with someone who becomes an Olympic athlete and you work with someone who gets more involved in coaching and they get to go to the Tokai University, which is a Mecca. And then on top of that, a woman gets to compete in the Olympic games through the IOC from the connection that you have and from knocking on that door until they allow you in to get someone to that place is just such a um, such an incredibly powerful thing like um, I think many people would be you know would be so would feel so lucky to get to do one of the aspects of what you've done so I think what you're doing is is just such an incredible 
and powerful thing that um, you should be very proud, obviously. And, and I feel very fortunate because of our connection to this judo community and also because of this connection that you now live in the country that I live in, that I was like, oh, I need to reach out to this person. I've, I've read a little bit of your story and I need, to, I need to have a conversation with you. And then you were so grateful with your time to, to allow me to have that conversation it makes me feel so like proud to get to, to talk to you and hear your story. And, and hopefully um, other people will have the opportunity to hear it because that's, that's really incredible. What you're doing is really incredible. Thank you so much. much. That's very, very encouraging. Um, I need to hear that sometimes because mm -hmm. things have been really hard lately. What the athletes, now our athletes are all in hiding. Um, scholarships are very competitive to get uh, in North America. And there's a lot of administration, a lot of advocacy. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, our um, annual report is coming very soon. It will be available on our website. You're welcome to uh, read it. Right. Um, so it highlights the, um, the accomplishment that the organization had, not myself, because we have board members, we have volunteers, we have members, uh, we have a lot of members. Um, actually, we have teachers in the program, we have students, athletes, everyone. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would like you to read the um, annual report. It will be ready uh, sometimes after June 9th. And um, yeah, I, I have to give a lot of credit uh, to, um, to all this work, to be able to work uh, for judo, because I love the philosophy of judo when it says Thai Sabati, the control of mind and body, because once you have control of your mind and body, you can control your life, basically. Uh, you can control your surroundings, you can you can be aware of your surroundings, you build confidence, you learn how to interact with people, you learn how to build confidence step by step, and you also learn how to be humble. The good thing, another good thing about judo is when you go on the judo mat, you become very humble because everybody's in the same uniform, you take off your shoes and you train with everybody else with different backgrounds from different backgrounds from different countries, different culture, different religion, different ages, different body size. So you, you it makes you humble because there's always someone better than you. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always someone wiser than you. So you have to, it keeps you on your toes. Like, oh, I can't be proud. I cannot be um, obnoxious person here because mm -hmm. there's someone else I have senses I have the coaches they always and I'm always and constantly um, learning so that is the the education part of the judo which I really like I when I came to Canada I used to go to Stevenson judo club as well as the Burnaby judo club and I used to train a lot um, but after I got busy with UBC full-time studies and I needed to job I, to need a, I needed a job and to establish myself in, in, in Canada, I got a bit busy. Uh, I wasn't able to go regularly, but now that I am, um, I train with the law enforcement on Sundays um, with the police judo. Um, every Sundays from 1.30 to 3 uh, p.m., we have women's classes um, only. And in these classes, there are so many um, Afghan newcomers from Afghanistan. Unfortunately, due to influx of Afghan refugees to Canada, um, there are there are very there are many many uh, women and these are the women who never done judo or any sports before in their lives but they come and they judo they try on the the uni uh, the uniform the key. usually they like the white one and the blue one and they tie their belt and they just roll they just roll on the mat they just enjoy they just have fun one time uh, this was a there was a new um, judoka white belt and she came in we taught her how to do somersault these are these women who never done a somersault in their lives before because they never had the opportunity back in afghanistan and she was only 24 years old and she got into cry after she started crying after um, trying a couple of uh rolling and i asked her why why she got so emotional in the judo and she said that she never had that chance in her life to be able to practice to roll like a child or like a human like a human um in person she got very emotional she's 24 years old she already has four children and her oldest one is either i don't, I don't want to get it wrong but she's he's either six or seven years old so you can do the math how young she was and she 
that was that was her entire purpose of life being a woman back in Afghanistan. But now they come in, and as you mentioned, the hijab and the police judo uh, culture is so welcoming, so good that it's up to the women to wear hijab or not hijab, whatever she feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really great, and it's also educational uh, for them as well. And she says that she's realizing now gradually that how important it is for her to have a confidence and the education as a mother, now that she has four children to raise, and one of them is already at school and very really an active child, and she needed that education. And when we let her know that she can bring her entire family and her kids can come, and to spend time and they can do judo as well. And they, she was very happy. So those are the, um, the changes, the positive changes. They may be small, but they aggregate over time. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply that by daily uh, life and then you multiply the daily life to months and months becomes years. So that's life changing um, mm -hmm. experience. It changed my life for the rest of my life and it's changed so many other people's lives as well. Right. And, and one thing that about judo that you've mentioned multiple times that I can agree, like I can't agree more is I'm the baby of five children. So I was brought to the dojo every day before I started judo and I was allowed on the mats at three and a half. So judo has always been very much family oriented where that's not always the case with some sports. And it also means that many children do judo together. So little boys and little girls roll together and where that's a very powerful thing. And I believe to be very powerful is that judo is very intimate. It's like hugs, you know, you're hugging each other, this physical contact. And so what's really great is women become and little girls, they become strong, they become confident in their body that they're physically capable of doing things that can lead to a lot of um, growth in self defense and, and feeling like they can protect themselves and being physically capable, as well as little boys, which become men and men and, and everything in between also understand what's appropriate in an appropriate way to interact with women. You have a sensei, you often have assistant coaches that are on the mats, you have other people, you have other people as references. So it's really important if, if boys and girls never interact, and one day they do interact, it the interaction doesn't necessarily go well, they, they, you know, ignorance leads to issues, as we've said before. And so there's so many types of education. And judo i believe is a great way of physically educating people and it also has a social education component which is really strong and powerful and so in canada when you have those interactions that leads to a lot and i would believe that the the period of time that judo was being accessible to women in in afghanistan would lead to a lot of growth for both sexes as well in afghanistan that men would understand more and, and when men see women more educated the view of what they're capable of is going to change, right? Like then they start gaining respect for these women while the women gain respect for themselves. So it's, it's, it's really powerful and awesome to hear of, of people like starting judo and falling in love with it and feeling the benefits of play and roughhousing and things like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, there's a strong component of the judo is the physical literacy. And the physical literacy, as you said, it's not only for social interaction, but it's also like awareness of your body and how you grow up, the cause of confidence and, and um, very empowering in general and everything. And on top of that, I would like to always mention this in my um, interviews and discussions that back in 2016, I want to say, uh, I knew a girl who was conducting um, as research uh, for senior people that how to fall safely. And they and she wanted um, a judo card to come and demonstrate. And I went into her lab where she was conducting this, um, this research and I was her guinea pig. So she put those uh, cables and those markers for 3D and um, so many other technical terms I don't know, but it was the, to study the fall, how to fall safely. So there was a carpet uh, beneath, uh, beneath my feet that it had a motor and she would turn it on. So the carpet will um, randomly and unexpectedly um, pull and make mm. me fall and to study how I fall, right. how a judoka falls versus how a non-judoka person falls. Right. So her study was conducting non judokas when they fall they usually tend to put their hands on the ground immediately in a straight line 
mm-hmm. where it's very vulnerable. So the natural reaction would be to, to prevent your body from falling on the ground. So you will put your arm, your, your hand on the ground immediately. Mm-hmm. And then that could lead to breaking your arm because your body cannot hold, sorry, your arm cannot hold the entire weight and put it for falling concrete or um, uh, other places. But when judo cars fall, whenever I fell, as soon as the carpet would roll, um, uh, sorry, move immediately very fast, I would fall and roll with it instead of blocking the fall with my arm. Right. Which uh, I would roll uh, with the fall, which was very interesting and which was very um, educational that if everyone um, learns how to fall properly, uh, it's very beneficial and it's very, it's life-saving, especially to seniors. And she discussed how that the judo fall and the role is, how that is related with the human evolution when human firstly began, how to walk on two feet and how to control mm-hmm. body, um, that and how it is, um, you have seen how a girl is you walk with the arms forward so mm-hmm. that's how the human evolution and then you gradually st- st- stood up on your um, on your feet and you you would roll on, on one side and it's very safe which i thought very is very very beneficial for everyone um, to do it could be actually life-saving experience right yeah the i read one um reference on the cdc and I believe they said in the United States alone that they estimate seven people will die every hour by 2030 from not knowing how to fall safely. Seven per hour will die, which is crazy. And that's in the United States, I believe. So um, that's one thing that I'm a huge advocate of as well is, is um, become a judoka for a day, learn how to fall. You're so much less likely to get injured. The president of my association, uh, she was... She works in Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. We have ice a lot. It's very cold. And she works uh, with an airline company. And she slipped. Her feet went way up in the air, lands flat on her back. And her boss was standing right there. And Chantel got up and brushed off her arm and went, I'm fine. And her boss was like, what just happened? Um, But when you've done it enough, it becomes natural. Falling in a safe manner becomes natural. It's such an important tool. And the less likely you are to get injured and the more comfortable you feel falling, the more likely you are to stay active, whether that's in high performance sport, whether that's when you're elderly and carrying your own groceries, or if you're playing soccer, it doesn't matter what it is. If you are more, if you're going to get hurt, you're less likely to continue to do it. And when you get up and you have a minor scratch, you're like, oh, that could have been bad, but it was great. Um, the one that got me is the first time I ever went snowboarding. I don't know if you've ever gone snowboarding, but living in British Columbia, you may have gone down some mountains. Mm. Uh, first, first time I went snowboarding, snowboarding every time, time I leaned on the back edge of the board, the board would kick out and I'd land flat on my back. And one time down the hill, I must have fallen 25 times. And I got to the bottom. Obviously, I was not a great snowboarder. And so I got to the bottom and all that was wrong was my hands were red. And I just thought, if that wasn't me, if that wasn't a judoka, at some point, I would have broken something because I fell fast and hard a number of times. So, so yeah, I, uh, I, I'm such an advocate for like the power of learning how to fall and how important that is in everyday life. And we see it all the time, you know, people walk outside down the street, they slip and fall and you just see it. And if your whole body weight lands on one small joint, like your wrist, that's, you know, that's going to be a very bad day. So yeah, I'm, I'm such an advocate for, for teaching people how to properly do break falls. So it's, it's awesome that you, you see it the same way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and so I used to assume this, uh, and human beings would think that because think that oh, our natural our natural instincts were protect us. I know how to protect myself when I fall, but actually we don't. We don't know how to fall properly. This is a this is a learning opportunity. It's a learning process for us how to fall safely and so how to recover um, immediately. And I fall a lot because I'm clumsy. I don't look i don't i don't watch where i'm going i could slip my my foot easily um on a rock at the beach or even like a carpet edge of the carpet but because i got used to falling on the judo mats i'm not afraid to fall um um, i have fallen on concrete and sand on uh, grass um even in winter in in Canada on black ice, but it was not so bad as if I didn't know how to fall. Mm. I remember during winter, I was in Langley visiting a family member. I slept on black ice on the street. I just rolled with it. It hurts, Mm. 
Mm -hmm. It hardened because it was cold as well, but it was not so bad. I did get scratch on my right um, elbow and a little bit on skin on my on my uh, face, but this could have been uh, worse. Mm -hmm. Had I tried the old-fashioned technique um, that blocked my block myself, I, as you said, just one on one joint on my breast, I, I would have been in ER immediately. But I was not on ER, and I was I was fine. Right, right, yeah, and then I guess. Um... Yeah, to that point of like, it's, there's so many injuries that can come from it too, right? Like you have concussions, you have hip fractures and all of these things, like really significant injuries. It's not just breaking your arm. It's, you know, a, you get a couple concussions and we know the consequence of that or a fractured skull or, or all of those types of things. So yeah, it's such a powerful, it's such a powerful tool for people. And I really think it should be part of physical literacy. I think it should be taught. I think it should be taught in schools. I think, I hope that judo plays a part in getting teachers in schools that this becomes part of physical education in the school is that people learn how to fall. I think that's something that Canadian judoka should push for. And that's something that um, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the position that I'm in, that we have judo as a part of the school curriculum. And it's in one school district, and it's going to be in a second that 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 becomes a part of the curriculum, because I think it's a very powerful thing. You play hockey, you're going to fall down. You figure skate, you're definitely going to fall down. Um, so just to have an active lifestyle safely falling is, is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the, the one other thing I want to highlight one more time, I know you'd mentioned it earlier is I, I hope, and I believe there will be lots of, lots of people that are interested in trying to help with the movement that you've created. And so I'd like to give you an opportunity of how people can get involved and, um, and help educate and help in coaching or whatever, whatever you, uh, avenue you'd need. Right now, we are specifically looking for mentors, teachers to uh, mentor and teach English to our students um, in Afghanistan. All the class classes are held virtually. Um, and the girls are given stipend back in Afghanistan so they can buy data on their phones so they'll be connected with their, um, with their teachers. Um, and we also have advocacy um, um, going on, uh, hashtag walk with Afghan women. That's, uh, that's um, 45 minutes walk that anyone and anywhere can post it. Um, people get together and they walk for 45 minutes and they post on social media, hashtag with Afghan women. Um, recently, a um, couple of uh, high schools have done that in Vancouver, where the high school um, students, uh, grade 11 and grade 12, and grade 8, they, together, they made giant signs, hashtag walk with Afghan side to bring awareness, to bring visibility to um, the issue and advocate on behalf of those girls in Afghanistan who, who can't advocate uh, for themselves. Um, also join the, uh, join the organization. If you are a judo coach, uh, we would be honored to have you. We have many judo cars in Afghanistan who are just sitting at home. Um, they're doing nothing. Uh, uh, these days, so we would love to connect you with them. And this is a one-on-one -on -one mentorship uh, program. And the privilege and the honor of this program is that our teachers will get to spend one-on-one -on -one time with the students, and they will see the the progress, uh, the growth, and the how the student tries from beginning to the end. For example, our um, teacher in, in in New Finland, and um, you can always visit our website. If you are interested and anybody's interested, they can send us an email at info at womanleaders.ca. And we have many volunteers and members who will um, answer that email and we will get back to you as soon um, as we can. And just, yeah, visit the website. Let us know what can you help, what are your interests, and we will go from there. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we cross paths again soon. Yeah, I yeah. hope so too. Have a terrific afternoon.